Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Dell's stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Dell develops, sells, repairs, and supports computers and related products. The company sells personal computers, servers, data storage devices, software, computer peripherals, HDTVs, cameras, printers, and electronics. The company is well known for its innovation in supply chain management and electronic commerce, especially in its direct sales model and its build to order or configure to order approach to manufacturing, delivering individual PCs configured to customer specifications. For a long time, the company was mainly a hardware vendor, but with the acquisition in 2009 of Perot Systems, Dell entered the market for IT services. Subsequent to that, the company has made additional acquisitions in storage and networking systems with the aim of expanding their portfolio from offering only computers to delivering complete solutions for enterprise customers. The company is headquartered in Round Rock, Texas and was founded in 1984. It trades on the New York Stock Exchange, Deutsche Börse, Mexican Bolsa, Börse Muenchen, Vienna, Sao Paulo, and London Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 43 billion market cap. They're trading at $56 a share and they have 764 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So they have lots of free cash flow. It nearly doubles from five and a half billion to ten and a half billion. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And they had their highest number ever in a trailing 12 months over seven billion dollars. Revenue is a sales for the company and that also peaked in a trailing 12 months breaking a hundred billion dollars. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. And that grows each year, almost 32 billion in a trailing 12 months. Below that is their operating expenses. These are all the expenses not directly tied to making the product. And below that is their operating income, which was negative in 2019. Now it's over six billion in a trailing 12 months. They do have a good amount of debt on their balance sheet, over $50 billion of debt. So they paid 1.6 billion of interest on their debt, which looks like the lowest amount they paid in a while. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which is positive every year, except in 2019, it's negative 2.2 billion. This is the company's income statement from the latest 10Q. This shows us a trailing nine months in 2020 and 2021, and the trailing three months in 2020 and 2021. 22 billion of revenue from product sales, 7 billion from services. So they had 28.4 billion of revenue in the three months ended 1029. Here's a breakdown of their revenue, 8.4 billion from infrastructure solutions, 16 and a half billion from client solutions, and 3.2 billion from VMware. And their revenue went up in every category comparing to the same time frame in 2020, especially in client solutions group. That went up from 12.3 billion to 16 and a half billion. VMware used to be part of Dell, but they spun off that company into its own entity. It's still a wholly owned subsidiary of Dell, so they have to consolidate all of VMware's financials onto theirs. VMware is a public company, so if you go to their financials, you can see in the three months ended 1029, they had a revenue of 3.2 billion. If you own Dell stock before the spinoff, you retain your shares of Dell, but you also receive shares of VMware. The spin-off of VMware was finalized on November 1st, just a few weeks ago. The expenses tied to the 21.5 billion is 17.6 billion, and the expenses tied to the 6.9 billion are 2.8 billion. So obviously they have higher margins in their services division. Their SG&A expenses went up from 4.8 billion to 5.3 billion. The increase in SG&A is from employee related compensation and benefits. Also an increase in outside services, mainly connected to VMware. Their R&D expenses are mainly employee compensation from developing new software. 
although R&D expenses decreased as a percent of revenue. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which went up a ton from 881 million to 3.9 billion. The trailing nine month revenue improved from 2.2 billion to 5.7 billion. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. So it nearly doubled from 2019 to the trailing 12 months. Every year they have lots of operating cash flow. They do invest a lot in CapEx because they are a manufacturing company. 2.6 billion in the trailing 12 months. If they buy a warehouse to manufacture products, that goes into CapEx. If they buy machinery and equipment to build products, that also goes into CapEx. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow and they have lots of free cash flow remaining each year. They have been reducing their debt load most years. They increased it in 2019, but in 2020, 2021, and the trailing 12 months, they decreased their total debt load. That is a big concern with people, the amount of debt this company has. They do not pay a dividend, but a way to reward shareholders is to buy back stock. They buy back lots of stock. 14.5 billion in 2019, 3.6 billion, 1.6 billion, 1.7 billion. When a company buys back common stock, it decreases the shares outstanding. It makes your shares more valuable. This is their cash flow from operations section from the nine months ending 2020 to the nine months ending 2021. And the way you calculate CFO, you start with your net income, then you have to add or subtract the non-cash items on the income statement, then adjust for changes in working capital. So we start with 5.7 billion of net income, we add back 3.7 billion of depreciation and amortization, 1.4 billion of stock-based compensation. That 4.3 billion was mainly from the gain on the sale of Boomi. They gained 4 billion from that sale. The reason we reverse it out here on a cash flow from operations section is because that gain is reflected on a cash flow from investing section. That's where it belongs and we don't want to double count it. I'll show you later when we look at the cash flow from investing section. We had a cash outflow of 1.6 billion from accounts receivables, so we extended credit to customers. But when those customers pay for their products, then it'll be a cash inflow. We bought $2 billion of inventory, so that's a cash outflow. We purchased $5.1 billion of product on credit. So that's a cash inflow for this period. But when we pay for those products, it'll be a cash outflow. Even though we reported a gain of 5.7 billion, we actually generated 7.2 billion of cash flow. This is their cash flow from investing and cash flow from financing sections. The trailing nine months of 2020 and the trailing nine months of 2021. They purchased 320 million of investments. These are probably short-term investments. They received 454 million on the sale or maturity of investments. CapEx of 2 billion. This also includes capitalized software development costs. Here's the $4 billion cash inflow from Boomi. They mentioned this in the company's report. They received 2.1 billion of investing cash flows, primarily driven by cash proceeds from the divestiture of Boomi. There was a smaller divestiture of RSA security. In their financing section, they received 326 million from the proceeds from issuing common stock. They repurchased 35 million of common stock from their parent. They repurchased 1.2 billion of common stock of their subsidiary. They added and repaid 13 billion of debt. They had a cash outflow of 1 billion. Last year was a cash outflow of 3.5 billion. Let's look at the capital structure. They have 9 billion of equity, 50 billion of debt. They're 15% equity, 85% debt. So they're pretty leveraged. Their net debt is 28 billion. And I gave them the highest whack on Finbox, 10.3%. And that's a discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated cash flows through 2024. And we also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year 2024. We discounted those numbers back to today's new weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $98 billion. We divide that by 764 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 128. They're trading at 56, so they're trading at a 56% discount. It's a really strong buy according to the model. The average analyst projects their revenue to decrease by half a percent. I decrease their revenue by half a percent per year. That's how I got their future revenue estimates. To get their future free cash flows, I need to see what percent of their revenue they convert to free cash flow. So I summed up these four free cash flow numbers. I divided by these four revenue numbers. And that comes out to 8.4%. So I multiplied their future revenue estimates by 8.4%. 
That's how I got that future free cash flows. Simply Wall Street is even higher than me. They're at 162 a share. They're saying the stock is 66% undervalued. Eight analysts priced this stock and the average price target was $62. So it seems like for the past two years, the stock has pretty much only gone up. So wherever you bought it, you should have made a profit. They have a beta of one, so the stock moves with the market. It's gone up 46% in the past 52 weeks, much better than S&P 500, which went up 25%. The 52 week low was 36, the high was 59. And the stock is trading above its 50 day and 200 day moving average. Five to six million shares are traded each day on this stock. 87% of the shares are held by institutions and almost 3% of the shares are shorted. They employ a lot of people, 158,000 employees, and it seems to be going up over time. If you put $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you'd be really happy at $92,000 today. That's a 25% annual return. It's not a good sign when you see insiders selling the stock and has only been selling, no buying. The reason the stock price was so high, $100 at one point, that was before the company spun off VMware. So the stock price had to be adjusted down. But investors didn't lose money, they just got shares in Dell and VMware. The general public owns two thirds of the company and institutions own one third. The biggest shareholder is Dodge and Cox at 5%. Their valuation is worth $2 billion. Then Elliott Management, BlackRock, Vanguard, and last is GIC. They have amazing price multiples, a PE of 6.1, that's just unbelievable, a price to sales of 0.4, and a price to book of 4.8. Here's a list of their non-current assets. They have 6.9 billion of property, plant, and equipment. This is net of depreciation. 1.8 billion of long-term investments. 5.3 billion of long-term receivables. 41 billion of goodwill. Goodwill is an intangible asset. You get goodwill when you acquire a company for more than its net assets. Net assets is assets minus liabilities. They have 12.3 billion of other intangible assets and 11.5 billion of other non-current assets. They have a solid ROIC of 14%. Even though they have a lot of debt, they can cover the interest on their debt more than three times. When a company has a lot of debt, Sometimes it can inflate their ROE. That's why they have a really high ROE of 79%. Their current ratio and quick ratio are both below one. They have 22 billion of cash on their balance sheet, 14 billion of accounts receivables, 5 billion of financing receivables, and 5.4 billion of inventory. So they have $57 billion of current assets. They have 16 billion of short-term debt, 27 billion of accounts payable, and 10 billion of accrued liabilities. Deferred revenue is the best debt to have. This means customers paid you upfront for a product or service that you haven't delivered yet. So it's not actual debt. Once they ship out the product or provide the service, then they'll take that money out of deferred revenue and put it onto the income statement as revenue. So you can really strip out 17 billion from current liabilities. So that means they have 52 billion of real liabilities. They have 57 billion of current assets, so they can cover their current liabilities with their current assets. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry, I've done videos of 10 companies in the same industry as Dell, and if Dell has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. So they have the best PE by far of all the companies. They're much better than average in price to sales. They're tied with Supermicro. They're a little worse in price to book. Their current ratio is worse than average. But like I said earlier, if you strip out the deferred revenue, it's really not that bad. It's above one. They have the best ROE of all the companies. They are high in debt, 85%. The average is 34%. And they're the largest company on this list at 43 billion market cap. The average is 17 billion. To summarize, I have them trading at a 56% discount. But Dell has always been a huge name and a really important part of the computer industry. The company is still led by the brilliant Michael Dell and they have an amazing brand name. This is one stock you cannot go wrong having in your portfolio. 
I rank their free cash flows 9 out of 10, their revenue 9 out of 10, and their ratios 10 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.